Hello, good people. Welcome to our show. Hello, bad people. Welcome to our show. Hello, everyone. Hello, guys. Welcome. Today we are going to discuss more about email marketing, about AI, how you can unite both to increase and get much better results. Uh, it's important to learn and let me explain why. Because 5% of marketers lost their jobs. If you ask me or any other great specialist experts, they increased results with AI because of uh, adapting fast, moving forward. And uh, uh, people lose jobs because uh, the, someone can adapt to AI and get great results, not because of AI. I'm so excited to discuss a lot more with Jimmy Kim. How are you? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me here. Uh, big pleasure. Wanna learn more? I know your skills about email marketing. Is great skills. I love them. I remember our first episode. Uh, you know how to share value. So I need more because we use a lot emails. We use at any different uh, goals, plans. I don't know. Like, for example, we use for link building, uh, for PR, for uh, sales, for almost everything. So I'm excited to learn more how to improve results because we have AI. Jimmy, before we start, just remind more about your self-experience, background, and anything that you can share with us about email marketing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give you my 60-second high level. So I've been an email marketer for, God, I'm, I'm now coming into my 14th, 15th year on the market. I started my email marketing journey in 2008. Uh, before I started this company called Sendlane, which is a unified email, SMS, and reviews platform for marketing automation for uh, e-commerce merchants, uh, I also was a merchant myself. And that's kind of where my story started ultimately, where I decided that I couldn't find a tool that I needed, so we built our own, and that's what we do today. So today, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Sendlane, an email, mar email SMS, and product reviews for e-commerce. Nice, nice. I'm going to change video format. Uh, sorry for that, because my team is asking me to provide this format for TikTok videos. <laughs> we can <laughs> short episodes, you know, to cover more broad audience. So we need to consider uh, all audience. Uh, and uh, Jimmy, um, let's talk about AI. Uh, yeah, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, some people lost jobs. Uh, and I disagree that AI replaced them. Uh, only people who adapt to AI can replace them. Uh, AI is a powerful tool, but it's not golden button. You can't click to get all results. And uh, if you use it smart, you can increase results. For example, we invested uh, a lot to AI content and uh, some of our projects uh, got plus 100k traffic. Uh, a lot of traffic in a very competitive niche, niches like investing, trading, where we compete with a billion dollar companies, big companies. Uh, and it's not because uh, AI can help us. AI only is a tool that can help us to create this high quality content. And for example, if you ask me to create any content about accounting, uh, about, I don't know, niches that I don't know, I can't. I can't because I'm not a uh, specialist on these directions. But if you ask me to do it in SEO or niches that I know, I can. I can because I can set up the right prompts. I can uh, edit results. And we got mentions on CNN, Investing, Bloomberg, Dow Jones, many big websites because of using smart. Can you tell how to do it in email marketing? Because uh, it's, for me, it's a big struggle. I still uh, trying to figure out how to you do know, it. Right. You know, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, obviously email marketing, marketing has a lot of faucets of like the type of email marketing you're doing, right? I think that what's interesting and you're completely right as you talk about like people losing jobs and different things, the reality is I don't know if you remember but when Photoshop came out in the 90s or into the 2000s like people designers were like this is the end of designing, they're just going to automate it, we don't even need guess what happened? We got better. All it did was make the level move up. So to me, I think it's crazy that if someone says that AI made them lose their job, it just tells me that they probably need to level themselves up to be useful in those categories. So now let's zap into email, right? 
now I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna talk about like a couple different types of email because I think it really does matter where you're utilizing you know AI per se in different email habits, right? So we're gonna start at the top and we're gonna talk about the transactional email. These are emails of people doing things like I made a purchase, I made an order, I did all this stuff, right? AI plays a huge role and it's always already played a role in that, right? Where it's pulling in data, it's congregating a good message and sending out information around an action, a transaction. Those places, pretty straightforward. I think people understand that. And then the next place that you go into is often the marketing email. That's the one that most people are using, driving revenue, driving money into their business. And when you think about AI there, it, it comes into like a multiple fold of different things that you got to think about. So we'll start with the first one, which you kind of mentioned, which is content. I think... I think when you think about AI, people have a misconception of the way to leverage it. And you've kind of already nailed it. It's a, it's a 10X factor. It's an accelerator. It's a optimization. It's a, it's a line skip a header. Like, I don't know where, how many words I can use with it, but it's giving people more options to move faster and get the information they need to make the action. However, there's a core of what marketing always will drive that you'll never be able to use AI, which is probably part of the struggle you have is that where a lot of things you can use, you can solve the strategic side of it. In email, for example, especially especially if you're on the customer communication side or lead generation side, the copy and content is always evolving. It's always changing. And the human touch of the strategy around the overarching strategy is never to be replaced, in my opinion. That's something that you just can't replace because it's the human creative that makes that drive, that action happen, the conversion happen, the connection to happen, ultimately. But where AI starts to come into place is helping you optimize and seeing those targets faster, being able to deploy on the things that you want to go out into the market, right? For example, how can I use AI? Okay, maybe I can't use AI to create the campaign all in all for me. Sure, you can kind of have an idea, a rough idea of like, you know, what segments and different data you want to hit. But the email itself, you can use parts of it with AI, right? Help me generate an image alternate it, change it. You can use it for also creating some high level copy, right? And it's, and you mentioned it already with prompting and language and understanding AI won't do it unless you learn AI and learn how to prompt and learn how to use chat GPT and tell that what you do, right? It's not about with email creation. It's not just write me an email. You've got to give it a formula. You've got to tell it what to do. If you've got a website, if you're using a plugin, you got to plug in and scrape the site. But then that site has to be well done too because it translates to each other just because you have a site and all the data doesn't mean that site happens. So to me, the fundamentals of being able to leverage, it starts with understanding what you're actually using. Again, a tool. And you need to understand how to leverage that tool and use it within your email marketing. So now you're at your content level and you're trying to design a content. You've given a formula. You have got the, you know, let's just say you're giving the problem solve, uh, problem pain formula and you told it to write a formula, it writes an email. Great. Now you go in there as a marketer, probably humanize it just a little bit. So what has it done? It saved me a few minutes of creating an image, creating my, everything it's doing is accelerating me, making me a faster human and outputting a faster result. And then you take it all the way to the next step, which is, wow, we've got the email out. It's sending. Well, then there's the campaign data, the analysis of it. Again, you can leverage it with AI. You can load that data into an AI. And what it's going to help you do is see the trends that you might not be able to see faster, or you can ask those questions faster. Again, leveraging the tool that's available. Again, when I go down to it at the end of the day with AI, you know, leveraging it for content creation and stuff, it's helpful. It's definitely there. It's saving you time. And yeah, maybe you don't have to, you don't need all the same resources that you might've needed in the past, but every person is making their adjustments. If you're a designer in email, for example, you should be learning prompting language on mid journey. So you can understand how to make better images and adapt them. And when your email marketer says, Hey man, I want to split test something. Here's four different versions of it. I already made it because AI helped me make those really fast after I made my first variation. If I'm a copywriter, I'm also com co continuing learning prompting language and becoming better at the AI side of things because that's going to teach me how to go off and get better copy and different copy so I can split test that too, right? It's Marketing is always the fundamental. The human is always the final element. And all these things are part of the drive there. And then, of course, the last part is really audience, segmentation, data. That's all because of and analysis, analytics. I think what really dies in email marketing is the need for like an analyst, for example. You don't need an analyst. You got ChatGPT. That's your new analyst, for example, right? Things like that change and those people might need to evolve and they can't be analysts anymore. Maybe they need to be prompt people that make analysts so they can spread across their organization. So there's like ways you got to think about how to evolve with what's happening right now. 
in my humble opinion, all it's really doing is just accelerating people, which is great. And two, it's just changing the narrative of how easy it is actually to build a product, to build data, to take data, to do services, to take actions. These are all just becoming easier and easier. Nice. Yeah, valuable. Uh, let's talk about, uh, more about this formula. You mentioned two times we need to craft this formula and it's not simple. And I think uh, we need to have experience because I can't craft this formula for accounting. For uh, other niches, I can for uh, marketing SEO because I can feel what kind of results I want to get. And uh, I think it's important to have writing skills because without writing skills you can't check results you don't know it's good or not so uh, let us know for example for average person i mean like um for companies that have no writing skills that have no uh, experience with uh, prompting uh, crafting these formulas what to do how to create this formula and mention and tell more about editing how to edit these results with human touch yeah so you know when you think about it right like there's different there's different prompting when it comes to like email copywriting right like you could say like write me a email marketing campaign using like a picture promise approve a push framework right like that's a framework that could come into place right and you tell it that framework and you say hey they need to desire a certain product so that languaging is not something that's easily taught or learned you've got to go try and test it right and you've got to get specific like you know describe the product describe the testimony provide a testimonial with backup promises encourage the reader and you've got to be able to take some of that language i think one of the things you're basically saying is like how do you come up with the frameworks and i would say okay here's some of the frameworks that i know off the top of my head there's the whole problem solution framework there's also like a star story frame uh star story solution so it's like creating a story around the product and then uh, showing that as a solution, right? There's like the awareness, comprehension, action framework. That's the one where it's like, you take the, uh, you take the, here's the problem. Here's how you kind of, why it's so important here to how's you do it, right? Like the objection framework, you could say the five, three, seven objection framework. You can use that. You can use the, the four C framework. I mean, there's so many frameworks that are out there that people need. So this is where it gets really tricky, right? I can tell you all the frameworks that I can tell you right now, but if you don't understand the basis of marketing, if you don't have the yeah. basis of the strategy, if you don't have the basis of why I'm telling you this, none of this really matters. So to your question is, what do you need to go learn? You actually need to start learning with marketing and say, okay, I understand all the frameworks of marketing. Then you have to leverage ChatGPT to go off to learn those frameworks that you want, train your AI to have the right frameworks understood that that's what you want to deploy. And then you got to test the heck out of it, man. It's not like yeah. uh, I just go up and log in and tell it to write something for me and it's going to spit it out. Man, sometimes when I'm working on frameworks, I'm pages and pages deep telling it to do it and it's still not right, not even close. <laughs> and you're always you're always working on, you're like, you know, what can I do? Maybe it's that little push that I need to tell, oh, be more friendly or, or help me be more solution oriented. Like you've got to keep working on it until you find that tone and it takes a while. And so again, going back to it, if I'm a new company and I'm learning, investing and in getting someone investing their time in learning, prompting, languaging, understanding the right marketing and formulas that you guys are doing and deciphering it into something that the AI can understand. Those are all things that you got to go through. Yeah. You, you remind me, Mr. Beast, you know, once he said, uh, if you want to start video marketing or YouTube channel, you need to film a hundred bad videos. And <laughs> I used uh, the same approach uh, for my PR campaigns. I wrote a hundred bad <laughs> PR emails. Uh, many companies, journalists uh, put uh, my emails to spam inbox. Uh, but uh, today, I think I learned uh, how to avoid it. I learned what I did wrong. I uh, improved my skills and uh, we got great results with PR. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good idea to write a hundred bad emails, a hundred bad videos, or anything like that. And yeah, it's tasty, an experiment. Uh, nobody knows what actually will work for your campaigns, especially in email. Uh, for example, once I spoke with email marketing expert and he told me uh, he got the best results with long emails. He, he can write long emails. It doesn't mean that we need to write only short emails because it's best practice. If you can write a long email to uh, win in the beginning, to catch attention, to keep until the end, yeah, you can get great results. Uh, so, Jimmy, can you tell about how to 
improve writing skills in email because I think it's not like if you can write blog posts that you can write emails. It's another story. So email email is a direct response copywriting. Uh, that's the most generic way I've explained it. And if you don't understand what that is, you should probably go look at it. And I always, I always, okay, look, it depends on your age that you are as you're listening to it, which you are. It could be as simple as do you remember those old flyers you used to get in the mail in your in your postal office that were really long and they had this basically a giant sales pitch? It would tell you all about the great things that are happening and how great it is, right? You're doing the same thing with email. And the reason why people are struggle with email uh, copy versus maybe a blog copy and different thing is you're not selling the steak. You're selling the sizzle right? You sell the sizzle, right? I use an analogy when you're at like a Mexican restaurant. And I like this one because I like fajitas, but if I order the fajitas, which I always do, and I order the fajitas at a Mexican restaurant, you hear it sizzle, right? And you smell it right before you see it yeah. before you <laughs> taste it. An email is not the steak. It's the sizzle. It's the sound. It's the hype. It's excitement, right? It's a different st style of copywriting. Email copywriting is not the same as blog writing or copywriting in general, there's a different skill to it. It's less words. It's more actionable. It's more feature solution as a framework often behind it. So, you know, I mentioned it in my last part of what we just talked about when it comes to leveraging chat GPT, there's frameworks that are out there. Figure out what framework you like, use that framework. And that's where you'll start to improve. These frameworks aren't out there because they're just made up out of thin air. These frameworks are out there because they're proven time-tested frameworks. They're done by direct response guys often. So mm -hmm. I would tell you if someone says, I'm trying to learn this, I don't understand why I can write a blog post, but I can't write an email. You got to go learn a completely different skill. Sure, you can write, but guess what? There's a difference between writing as a direct response writer versus writing for a blog writer. In direct response, most people tell you, don't try to teach them more than a five, a, a fifth grader language, right? Real, simple, straightforward, actionable things. In a blog, you can get technical, you can get nerdy, you can talk about different things. It's a total different explanation of things. So that's where I yeah. would say that you need to think about. Yeah, it's like if you can play soccer, it doesn't mean that you can provide great results in basketball. Yeah, you have a ball, you in good shape, but <laughs> it's another skill, another level. No, not at all. 100%. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, uh, let me share my uh, daily routine. I start my morning to open my email. And when I see that I need to read 400 emails, and uh, I usually, that's okay. Okay, if I need, okay, uh, I will try my best. But uh, I'm busy, so I share like 20 minutes to read 400 emails. I, it's impossible to read 400 emails for 20 minutes. So most emails I don't read. Uh, and I choose uh, by reading headlines, by checking who sent me this email. So, for example, if someone can pay me uh, 20K for my consultancy services, of course, I open this email first. Then sure. I can uh, check other emails. If I have time, I can open weird emails. So tell uh, how to win attention busy people like me in the beginning. I mean, like uh, if they have only 20 minutes, but they need to check 400 emails. Yeah. Oh, man. What an interesting problem you have, right? Like I'm very good with it. It sounds like you have this, uh, you, you have that struggle. So I do the same thing that I do with everything else I do in my life a little bit, at least my personally, how I check it. I look at the from name. Do I know who that is? If it, yeah. if I don't, then I look at the subject line. If I don't know who the subject line is, I'm literally going to check in and hit delete or archive. I literally just don't care. Mm -hmm. We do get mm -hmm. flooded like that. And really, that's where the subject line really comes into place. And it's about, mm -hmm. again, I kind of go back to it's copywriting, having a good formula, man. You know, you know, when people, people did the Black Friday sale, let's just say, let's just talk about Black Friday. Everybody, and I was laughing at my inbox. I was taking screenshots of this. I'm going to post it. But everybody says the same thing. Black Friday sale is live. So guess mm -hmm. what? The only thing you have differentiating is your brand at that point, right? Who you're from, who the sender is from. So it's the same idea when you're thinking about your own email. You're doing the exact consumer behavior on the other side that you're thinking about. I can't check my emails. How do I stand out? Of course, you said it. An important person. A subject line that really pops out at you, but otherwise you're going to ignore it. It's the same thing. So your challenge with that on the other side as a marketer too, that you're also at a flood of 400 emails that you're receiving. And it's a question of how to get the noise behind it. So there's not a really good answer, except it comes down to copywriting again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think um, it's important to, you know, uh, we can divide 
recipients uh, in three categories. The first category like uh, clients, uh, employees, uh, the second category uh, people that you know, and third category you don't know these people, but so it's tough, it's tough to be open, but it depends on this uh, headline, it depends on the first sentence, because we still can see this first sentence uh, in the mailbox. So yeah, it's tough and it's skill. It's skill. You, you can get the results just using some best practices from chat GPT or any other AI tools. Uh, and it's like, for example, video marketing. Yeah. People bounce fast, uh in the first uh, 20 seconds like 80 percent of people leave video in the first 20 seconds uh, in youtube on tiktok yep. i i always watch like this you know uh, with uh, <laughs> my finger movements because uh, i think what, uh, it's what yeah we're trained it's how we're trained man we were trained by the application and now you have to fight as a marketer against your own training that you've been trained on yeah 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 i agree uh jimmy uh let's talk about um uh, learning your recipients uh, and satisfy their intent. Can you share uh, what to do? For example, if I have data and uh, uh, for example, uh, let's imagine my audience uh, adults plus 50 years, uh, they play some card online games because they don't want to learn new games. Uh, they have these habits to play old games. Actually, I'm asking about one of my clients, uh, and uh, sure. <laughs> so uh, and uh, uh, he failed to get results with email marketing because uh, mm -hmm. he used uh, average data. Average data, uh, most online games. Uh, I mean, like uh, young youngsters can play uh, most online games, but in card games, it's a different story. Only adults, people. So he wrote a bunch of emails uh, according to average data. He failed. Then he learned that to change approach. Uh, can you tell how to craft emails according to your recipient or buying persona? So any tips about that? Yeah, you know, you know, this is a this is an interesting day old argument that I see happen quite often. And I'll kind of start with the simple one. You ever been to a website? And you know they do good volume, but you look at the website and you're like, God, that looks horrible. I'm sure you've seen that, right? But yeah. you know what? It, who it doesn't look horrible to? Your target audience. That's yeah. why it looks like that, right? And you see this, especially in the older demographics. You'll notice older demographics have less modern features on their website. They're easier to navigate. They're still using the old bars. They're really kind of ugly and bright colored and bold or big bold. It's because of your audience. Now, you've got to translate a lot of this actually comes from your actual conversion, your website and the sales that you're learning from. Because if you start to understand what they like, your emails and your marketing have to be complementary to that. Too often, I'll see people try to take brands and separate the brand look on email, trying to make them look nice and modern. And then your website looks like crap or the vice versa. Your emails don't have the, uh, the presence. Remember, you're selling the sizzle, not the steak often. So what you need to do is you need to be warming them up. The trust comes from that look and feel. So to your question, what do I do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is there's generalized data around where my data is, right? You've got GA, you've got all these things that are pulling in data, and you can start looking at generalization. It sounds like you already know that you have an older demographic, which means that you got more people on Yahoo, you got more people on AOL probably, less on Gmail, more on Hotmail, Microsoft, and those things, because that's what happens when you have an older generation. And that's also where most traffic is purchased, right? People who want older generation traffic often buy from like Yahoo or, or Yahoo, for example, is a perfect example of a place where traffic is a little bit older. And so when you have that, you have to start understanding the data. And when you have it, you've got the generalizations, right? You know the way that they want to be talked to. They're more wordy, right? We already know that for an older generation. So they need more storytelling. They need more generational communication. They need more explanation because they're, and they need more trust ultimately. And trust comes with the design and the copy and everything else that comes with it. And so the only thing you can really do, in my humble opinion, when it comes to trying to understand and adapt, it's just split testing a lot of different things out that you're doing, right? From the copy to the images, to the graphics, to the timing. You know, some a place that I've seen with older generations is people don't get the timing of an older generation, right? They, yeah. You think that they're just, just sitting around at 9 a.m. checking their email? They're not. You know what I mean? You got to catch them at the later times or the earlier times. So even timing becomes a place that you've got to start thinking about. So all those little areas, you've got to look at the data. You already have the pre-notion of the information, but the only thing you can do from there is start testing out little pieces of it to try to find where it is. I would start on my, probably on you guys, probably start with the copy, making sure that 
you have someone who is in the demographic that can help you understand and narrate the, the language and the voice that they need to hear. And that usually is a combination of the words that you're using combined with the tone, combined with the trust that it builds. You can't build all three without having your perfect market listen to you. And then you've got to tie that in with timing and all the other things. So that's all I can generalize. I, I can't, unfortunately, without seeing it and being a part of it, that's all I can really tell you from the outside of where I'd start to attack. Yeah, nice, nice. I'll, I'll share this episode with my client. Um, yeah, I think he, he will love it. Uh, it's interesting about this client. Uh, he paid me like uh, 16K uh, for my consulting services. And uh, what I started to do, I started to play these games. Uh, I played like <laughs> a few days. And when my son uh, saw me uh, that I'm playing these games, he asked, what's going on? You told me uh, that you always read books. You never play any games. Um, I replied, you know, I got this payment, 16K, uh, to play these games. What? I play all my life. Nobody pays me <laughs> for games. <laughs> why Why someone stupid pay you, not me? <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, funny, funny story. Um, Jimmy, I want to ask about uh, Sand Lane. Uh, you know, I think email provider companies, big companies, MailChimp, many big companies, a lot of budget. Uh, so can you tell how you stand out from the rest? Why you are better than companies that almost everyone knows uh, what is your strong side compared to such companies do you do you mean in a marketing front of how we've been able to do it or are you talking about more as a product side uh, product side I, I because i think uh, if my uh, listeners wanna change uh, their uh, email companies provider sure. so yeah uh, they need to know your benefits why you're better <laughs> yeah so i'll start with this very simple thing we're very much for a very specific brand sp specific segment of market so mm -hmm. we work with high growth brands generally doing at least a million dollars on their online channel or more and they're growing fast right and they're direct to consumer business and they're using a platform like shopify woocommerce big commerce or like a custom platform so our core demographic sells a physical product, usually 10 or more products with at least 50 SKUs usually. And that's where we like to service, right? So if you fall into that demographic, where we come special is A, obviously our product is very strong, robust, built for that type of business. Two, the support and the CSM program and the way that we support our merchants comes through a, a lot of that. And then three, deliverability is really much, in my opinion, best in class. We've got a world-class team and we own our own infrastructure. And that comes with it. And then last but not least, where, where it comes in is our typical competitor is a Clavio, Clavio attentive, Yatpo mm -hmm, customer. Mm -hmm. And we're saving them 30 to 40% on their bill just because we don't have the corporate structure. And we're unifying multiple products under one roof, allowing us to give you that price break. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And uh, how you adapt AI in your uh, product? I mean, like, uh, I, I see AI everywhere on LinkedIn, on uh, Google, on Facebook, everywhere. So tell your methods to adapt to AI. Yeah, so you know, you know what's funny about AI and it's 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 interesting at the marketer level, at the general human level level, it's all sounds new and fancy. At the software company level, we've kind of been doing it forever, right? Like over the last like 4 or 5 years we're using large language modeling and we're using machine learning and putting them together to do actions and behaviors inside the systems. That's what we call workflows and actions and be, and all these dynamic products recommended. So we've been leveraging it forever and we continue to, our vision has always been that we would be le leveraging machine learning and large language modeling to build optimization funnels and different things. So what we're working on the background is working through data and working at how to understand data to output optimization. So like imagining a, a welcome flow, and then an AI taking and optimizing, automatically increasing the speed, decreasing the speed, changing the way your email looks, changing the timing, putting the emails in different locations and understanding how to maximize the human behavior. Now that to me is where AI will become real powerful when it comes to software tools. Writing content and different things, I think are ultimately an insult to most marketers and the marketers we work with because they're in their high growth companies. They're not using AI. They're they, they're using their human skill brain because that's why they're high growth companies because mm -hmm. they're not trying to optimize. They're trying to maximize. There's a difference between that, right? Optimization means that you're trying to optimize for budget and timing and this maximizing means you're going to put all efforts in to make the most money out of it, right? It's different little mm -hmm. actions. So that's where we are. Um, that's where we always will be. And I think that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep doing things. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Uh, let's talk about email marketing mistakes uh, because I found if I start anything new, I mentioned about PR, I always fail. Without any exception, I fail, but I can learn how to go ahead, how to adapt. And I think if someone will start uh, email marketing to adapt with AI, they can fail. So tell how to avoid or minimize uh, such errors. Yeah, you know, we could probably go on forever and ever about it, but I'll, I'll just give, I'll give you the two, three things that I think most people struggle with when it comes down to it. Um, well, let me, let me start with the first generalization. Email is going to be a general large representation of your revenue in your business. And we as founders and owners and managers and marketers have this weird, we, we tend to want to hold on to this because we see the revenue value, you know, the dollar in control, but there's also great experts out there. So I'm going to start off by giving you something non-typical and say, if email is a representation of your business and it's not hitting the representation, so if you're in a D2C brand, which is who I work with, and it's not showing you 20 to 40% of your revenue or more, you probably effectively have a big leaky income bucket and you should go hire experts. And I know that people hate agencies, but there are good agencies out there that can actually help you progress that forward and make you win. So that's what I start with the first one before I even jump into it and say, if you've been thinking about it, even exploring it, just remember this. And I tell people this, if I'm a $10 million company a year, that means somewhere between two and $4 million of that revenue is coming from my email retention marketing. Why do I hire a $60,000 retention marketer to do that work to generate 4 million? That sounds stupid to me if you ask yeah. me. But if I go pay an agency $10,000 a month, that's really good. And they've got an entire team and I pay $120,000 a year to make $4 million. That's called good ROI, man. And so uh, I always start with that. All right. So now let's jump into it and say, I don't want to use an agency. I'm such a good marketer or whatever other reason. All right. Three things. One, we're going to start off with your audience management. You've got to understand your audience management. There's a difference between how customers are communicated and prospects are communicated. And the earlier you can separate your audience management from day one, the stronger your longevity of your retention program is because you can understand if they've purchased or they haven't. And so when I give people advice around this, it's very simple. You either a prospect who has never purchased, which means they're negative ROI, and your job is to continue pushing on them as hard as you can to get them to make a purchase or get off your list. All right. Yeah. Number two is a buyer. These are precious, man. 30, 40% of them might even repeat buy and you need to nurture them and create word of mouth engines out of them. At that point, you, you, you know, Starting new, I wouldn't go off and do more segmentation beyond that. But if you wanted to, you can start dividing those people off into their own versions and their own group. So that's number one. I'm going to start off with audience management. Number two, making sure you have lead generation, meaning you're capturing anywhere you can capture, a pop-up, a newsletter field, uh, different pop-unders and overs, connecting to your integrations, making sure that you're getting the lead. You could be surprised how many companies I meet that are just leaking leads everywhere because they're not maximizing it. Make sure that you've got all the places maximizing to collect the lead. So that's number two when I'm getting it started. And then number three is the content. Don't overcomplicate this for yourself. Don't overthink about customer journey until you're at maybe $10 million. You don't need much more than a cadence of email for your weekly, ca weekly cadence. So it could be, you know, on Mondays you send a newsletter, on Wednesdays you send a new product, and Fridays you send a sale, right? Your cadence on your email. Then you've got your basic automation flows that are the ones that are automated. You've got a new welcome, so they've made a purchase welcome. You got a pop-up welcome where they opted into something. You got an abandoned cart, maybe a browse abandonment. That's all you really need to get going. Otherwise, go focus on the acquisition side because the number one thing that comes into anyone who jumps into email marketing that doesn't understand sometimes is that you're only as good as your acquisition is because your acquisition creates customers that creates retention, right? Your email is helping drive more acquisition, but it's also also very important for the retention piece in order to make that happen. So without the top of the funnel action happening, your bottom of the funnel, your retention program is not going to be successful. And it's a, it's almost like a delay. You can almost see it with any business. I stopped by media today, 60 days from now, my email list is going to start having issues because I'm going to struggle because your retention program is not keeping up. Awesome. So valuable. So valuable. Jimmy, I have very basic question, but very important um, about design in email uh, because um, I see companies uh, still don't understand do they need to write just text or uh, to create 
design html version or just to add pictures uh, and uh, i know uh, some companies are great with writing just text to get great results some companies can create design to get great results but uh, let's share for companies who don't know <laughs> can you tell how to figure out <laughs> yeah so you know the design based email happened because people were very hyper analytical about their fonts their designs and their mobile formatting right if you have an image based email more mobile formatting becomes an easy solution however there was this thing called ai now we call ai which is now again the machine learning with large uh, large llms which are basically just basically what your spam filters are running off of. So here's the thing about images. Images were a way to avoid spam filters back even all the way back in 2008, 2009 when they were rudimentary. And the people who did it were like Viagra commercials and like free gold and like all these like really like shady places used it because they would get caught up on spam filters and this was the way they avoided. Somehow along the way, we fell back in that trap. And I think it comes back from, oh, Figma has a really easy export where I can export the images and load them up into email. That's great. And if you're doing amazing audience segmentation, it probably isn't hurting you very much. All right. But here's the reality. Most of the people listening on this, I guarantee you are not doing very good audience. I don't, don't talk 90 day audience of like, I I'm segmenting 90 day engaged. That's not good audience management. That's doing batch and blast in a modern environment. That's all you're doing, right? So if you're not doing good audience management, here's where you're faced up, up against. You are now being judged on two simple things that are occurring when an email is sent out. One, your data and two, the engagement, Right. Normally, if you write an email with words and languaging and things that people can read, you have number three, which is the spam scoring that's occurring at the ISP level when they're reading your content. Because you're doing design, it can only read some of the readable content on the design, but not much of it, and it has to make its own analysis and decision. So if you are on a risky front with a customer, and what I mean by risky front is if you've taken an email and your email address is there and you haven't opened 10 emails from that brand and you're receiving the 11th email, your internal spam score filter for that brand reputation is continues to lower. Eventually, at some point, Gmail will stop sending that to your inbox and start putting it into your spam box because you're not engaging. The, where design becomes really valuable here is that because design is there, there's no data for the ISPs to look at. They're just going to make an assumption, 11 emails, the data, I have no idea what's really in there. And audience engagement is very poor. Why don't I start putting this in spam? When you get into spam, it's really hard to get back out of it unless the user goes in and then finds it, pulls it out and tries to get you out or you're rewarming up a new reputation. So why that's number one. And the number two part that I think is even bigger for me is that all image emails have a big problem. And the problem is the accidental click. I don't know about you how many times I've taken an image only tried to make it bigger on my screen because I'm trying to look at the image and I accidentally click and it takes me to the website. It's not a real click, man. That was me accidentally just trying to look at an image. Secondly to that statement, I don't know what part of the image they clicked on. They might have just been trying to make an image bigger, not be clicking, right? So there's a lot of those problems that come into place. And I think that when people use image-only emails, they're not a modern marketer. They really lack the understanding of modern aesthetics. And they're just doing it because that's their job, ultimately. And they're not thinking about it strategically. So I'm not a fan of people who use image-only emails just because... I think that that was something we did 10 years ago and we need to evolutionize. Yeah, well explained. Um, but, you know, I, I usually use uh, one picture for uh, journalists if I can share uh, screenshots. It, yeah. it works well, but it depends. It depends. I agree. Sure, no, I, and there's nothing wrong with it. Look, again, yeah. audience management, there's an audience for no. it, there's things that happen. But if you're modern marketing and you're trying to expand your net and push and push the boundaries, like don't let the things fight you for no reason. This is like when you don't bring like, like I don't know, like they say bring water to the strip and you don't, you bring a small tiny water instead of bringing a big water when you had opportunity. Just bring the big water. Just do yeah. it right. You know what I mean? That's kind of my, that's kind of my explanation. Nice, nice. Uh, Jimmy, uh, I want to ask about your experience. I asked this question before, but uh, I still get a lot of these questions uh, from two people. The first uh, students who are looking for a way how to learn uh, from scratch. And the second, uh, business owners, uh, website owners, uh, founders of companies. Uh, they're looking for ways how to learn uh, the basic to hire or cooperate with experts who can lead them in the right direction. So uh, 
if you started today from scratch without any experience knowledge skills it's your first day in email marketing you didn't create this company you just <laughs> student uh so what will you do if you started from scratch Ooh, what a question if i had to learn from scratch and i learned about this thing email marketing so i'm probably not the normal person to ask this question because i'm a i'm a researcher and i'll go figure it out like if if i have something wrong with my house i go on the internet and research the living crap out of it till i figure it out so that's what I would do. And that means that I would go out and do it. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have a place where I think people are teaching. I, okay, let me let me take this back. If you actually go to almost any SaaS company, they all have some kind of educational thing uh, out there. And to be honest, most of them are good enough. Learn about an open rate, learn about a click rate, learn about a revenue, learn about email, learn about the basics. And then you go off and start to follow people and find people. And I think we all know this in this world of TikTok and social generation, we're looking for social uh, social people in the market that are talking about it. Obviously, I talk about it on Twitter and LinkedIn, for example, but there's a lot of other people. There's also YouTube where you can go search and understand it. But to me, if I was going to start off, it would just be going out and finding people that are talking about it and just slowly learning about it and understanding that though it seems complicated from the outside if you can ca i mean if you can build a website and capture a lead you can do the email marketing side it's not that hard yeah <laughs> and my final question about the future um yeah, when i see when someone can tell seo will never be dead i disagree i think everything has the end uh, and email will have the end but we far away from that uh, I don't know when teleportation or anything can replace, but it takes time and it decades, you know, to replace something. And today, email is a powerful tool. Email brings more sales than any other channel. Uh, I know some blogs that can bring uh, get million traffic, but they monetize with emails. So plus 90% of all sales are coming from emails. So, Jimmy, uh, I want to ask you, take your crystal ball. And let us know what kind of future will be in email marketing and how we can adapt to this possible future. Yeah, email is going to evolve. There's going to be two very simple things. Privacy is becoming bigger. We've all understood a 2024 into the future, more validated, like the blue check mark, right? Like I feel like Elon really helped us out, but the blue check marks becoming more relevant everywhere, right? Real, verified people, humans, authentic companies, right? Number one. Number two. It's just going to be about leveraging more inside of emails. You know, with a lot of the things, the rules and all the things, it, both SMS and email both have this, but there's a lot of evolution going on, right? AMP, which is accelerated, mo, uh, accelerated. I can't remember what the, web, uh, the terminology, but AMP is essentially allowing people to have interactive emails, right? In the past, it's been out for five years now, but in the past, it was so hard to do because you had to have basically engineers be able to design every email. Things are getting easier and easier. I believe that things are going to continue to get easier there. And a number two to that is I think that with email and the data and all this information that's happening, and of course, AI, the personalization and the level of communication will increase over the next couple of years with it. And it won't go away because you have to have one format of either email or, or an actual physical letter often. So I feel like the communication piece will be there. I just think that the attention will be harder to go. And it's really going to be about the future of communication. What I mean by that is when I look at someone in the Gen Z's today, they don't check their email, but they check the heck out of their SMS, for example. Well, I don't know what's going to happen when RCS comes out here in 2024 and that starts to change the way that people might communicate even more over there, or they might not like it and some <laughs> new tool will come out. So the future of email is being where the future of where the customer is. It'll always be a transactional piece of a receipt, but the marketing side, I believe will continue to evolve based around the communication channels. And I think most brands and people are starting to do it as I see SMS adoption is pretty high nowadays. And so is email marketing is starting to increase. So, you know, when you start seeing your local restaurant, your local barber send you SMSs, you know that this is becoming a mode of communication and you've got to be adapted to it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. My, my son, by the way, he usually checks uh, TikTok if someone <laughs> he wrote That's his. where he gets his news from. That's where he gets all his information from. It's, it's wild, man. It's wild yeah. the world changing right now. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Jimmy, it's a big pleasure. Thank you so Absolutely. much for sharing this time, for sharing all these valuable bombs. I love it. I love to learn. I'm going to follow you to get more valuable insights. Tell our audience the best way how to keep learning from you, how to reach out to you, how to follow you. 
Yeah, I, I live in two places. I live on X as Yo Jimmy Kim, so Y O J I M J I M M Y K I M, and then of course on LinkedIn you can find me and follow me there too. So I I publish content mostly around retention, e-commerce, email marketing, SMS marketing, some broad content. I don't do a lot of the founder side. We do share about company and Sendlane, what we do once in a while, but. That's where I'm at. That's where you'll find me. So come follow me, shoot me a DM. I do respond. I'll read it. If you just cold hard pitch me, I might not respond to you, but if you have a real authentic message, I'm always happy to chat. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I think Elon Musk didn't break your heart, you know, <laughs> why you still use X, but <laughs> so I think Elon Musk has time and more time, you know, <laughs> I think he's, I think he's done a great justice to the platform, allowing free, you know, like allowing people to be who they want to be in my opinion. Yeah, nice, nice. So, uh, thanks again, Jamie. A big pleasure. Uh, welcome back you. anytime to share more valuable insights. I think we will get more listeners who uh, are interested with email marketing. I'm going to follow you, to recommend to anyone to follow uh, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, X today. And yeah, thanks a lot, guys, for listening to us. Thank you.